There's power in the blood of Jesus. There will be power always, forevermore. Thank God for the power in the blood of Jesus Christ that washes, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And <clears throat> we're looking at the Passover. Um, this is part of what happened with the Jews when the Israelites, when God warned them and said, look, put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and on the lintels. And as they were doing that, the blood would drip to the bottom and actually represented a cross, which is amazing that someday that the Passover, that God's judgment would pass over us, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are washed in the blood accepted him and his fullness but now of course adam the whole reason why there is the blood of the lamb is because of adam's sin adam missed god and he um when he missed god he said um that god kicked him out of the garden of eden and so it is that he set before them life and death and adam chose death God said to him, we have life and death. If you partake of that fruit, in the day that you partake of that fruit, you will surely die, die. And he mentioned two deaths. And in the Hebrew, in the, in the, in the King James, you just see death. But in the Hebrew, it says death, death. Two deaths. So there was a physical death that took place 900 odd years later. And there was a spiritual death which happened immediately. And because of that, God had planned salvation. He knew that man was going to miss it. So he planned salvation. But in all of these things, obedience to God, commands is the way of life. Disobedience is the way of death. And Adam opened a doorway of death and to Satan to allow Satan to rule over our lives. But thank God, God always had a plan for man's salvation. And Man has tried throughout the ages to try and do something in some way that he can be righteous before God. He can do enough good works, uh, be born in the right family, all of these things, be very good and do all the things. But yet he falls short because religion, good works, mort uh, <coughs> morality, philosophy, all of that falls short of the glory of God. But thank God. Something that he saw in man from the beginning. He created man in the image, in his own image and likeness. And he took out of the dust of the earth, he created and formed man. And out of the rib of Eve, he formed woman. And yet, Jesus tells a, a, a kingdom of God, he says it's like, it's like a man that is searching for very precious pearls. And when he finds the one pearl of great price, he goes and he sells everything to buy that one pearl. So man is created out of dust. And man's sin has separated the doorway, closed the doorway of, into the presence of God. But what God saw is the pearl of great price. That every one of us, every one of us is valuable and precious in the eyes of the Lord. And that one grain of dust, just a speck of dust, placed in the hand of the living God, it becomes transformed from glory to glory into the same image of God. That was His divine purpose, for us to be then transformed from the old man into the brand new man through Jesus Christ. And that's what He saw. He saw a pearl of great price treasure hidden treasure in him when in matthew 13 verse 44 jesus said again the kingdom of heaven this is he's describing what the kingdom of heaven is all about the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and he hid and for the joy of it he goes and sells all that he has so it's same as the the pearl of great price uh, when he had sold all that he had, he bought it. And it was representing of what Jesus Christ, the price that he would have to pay to purchase us out of darkness, to purchase us 
as it were out of the dust of the earth and let them be transformed into the image of Jesus by the Holy Spirit, transformed from glory to glory. But that price was an exceeding great price that He had to pay for us. Throughout the ages, God has made a way that the Israelites could now come into the presence of God uh, once a year through the high priest who would offer the sacrifice for their sins. So the veil was a hindrance, a limitation to the presence of God. People couldn't just walk into the temple and say, Okay, Lord, here I am. No, they wouldn't even try it because they knew they were struck dead. The holy presence of God, no one could enter the holy presence of God without the blood and being the high priest once a year. He could now enter in and do the and uh, put the blood, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for the sins of the nation of Israel. And that's what he did. And he, is, he had belts, uh, bells at the bottom of his garment. And the bells would, as he was ministering, doing whatever the, the ritual that God had ordained, they would hear the bells and they would know he's still alive. So God has accepted the sacrifice. But when the bells stopped and they heard a thud, they knew, that's it. It was not accepted by God. And they had a rope tied to his feet to pull him out. That presence of God, that divine presence of God was limited only to the high priest once a year. Only once a year. So now, <clears throat> when they left Israel, um, out of Egypt, they had to put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels and the drip down and representing the Christ that there's a doorway going to be opened and the, the, the judgment of God would pass over them. And that's why Jesus said that I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. So he, made, he said, I'm the doorway. I'm going to create a doorway that you can enter into the presence of God. Matthew 20 verse 22 says, But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. <clears throat> Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, Yes, we're able. That's what the disciples asking Jesus to sit on his right hand and his left. It's not given to him. To them but he says are you able to drink of the cup and that's what Jesus had to partake of when Jesus remembered what he had to go through remember he understood the scriptures he knew every single thing that he had to fulfill there was nothing hidden there was no mystery and he knew as he said um, in John chapter 3 verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him, whosoever, so it's not limited to a certain uh, race, but whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So it is about whosoever would believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ alone, not in their good works. Our good works follow after we've received grace and received the kingdom of God and received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He made the sacrifice for our sins. But Jesus knew he had to go to the cross he knew that even as Moses lifted up that serpent, that bronze serpent, which means a judgment, and Israel had sinned, and those serpents came out from the desert and began to kill those people. And they cried out to Moses, can you save us? Moses said, Lord, what must I do? Um, and, Mo and God said to Moses, make the bronze serpent, and everyone that looks at that serpent will be healed. And that's exactly everyone who looks in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ will receive eternal life, forgiveness of their sins, and then walk in the light that God has given to us by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit of God. God loved the world. That's why He sent Jesus Christ to die 
in our praise, in our place. But the value that he sees in everyone individually, not just collectively as the body of Christ, but individually. That's why Jesus said, the pearl of great price. He's going to offer his life as the greatest price and the greatest sacrifice to redeem us out of bondage. Remember, man after Adam opened the door to death and Satan. Jesus is now going to redeem us, pay the ransom price, which is the price of redemption, to buy us out. And it wasn't with silver or gold. It's going to take something far greater than that, the blood of God. And Jesus had the blood of God which flowed within him. And that pure blood, that sacrifice that he made, purchased us, bought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He paid the full price. That's why the scripture says, you who are believers in Jesus Christ, you are not your own. You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. And remember, the price is not with silver and gold, as the scripture says. It is not with silver and gold. It's not of things corruptible, but it had to be purchased with someone that is incorruptible. The blood of Jesus Christ. That's why there's power in the blood of Jesus. For 2,000 years, the blood of Jesus still works for everyone who would believe and receive him. And not try and do their own works. Not try and work out their own salvation by their own. But to receive Jesus. He's the supreme sacrifice. He's the one that we can have and abide in us by the Spirit of God. He gave himself. The scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. That, uh, that we have one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Only one mediator. We don't have another mediator. We don't have angels. We don't have Mary. We have one mediator, the man. And there's a key there to that. The man, Christ Jesus. He had to take on flesh and become as man in order to pay the price of man who sinned. And through a disobedience, Adam sinned. He had to be obedient, the scripture says, even unto death. And that was the death of the cross. He had to pay the full supreme price for us. Man had to pay it in Christ Jesus. And it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. To be testified in due time, a ransom, he paid the full ransom price. Now we know there's a lot of abductions, a lot of things happening, and the, 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 those who abduct them, or people, or business people, they want a ransom. They want the ransom paid. And you see, we were abducted in a way through Adam, and now the full ransom price would cost the blood of a sacrificed lamb of God slain. The scripture says, from the foundation of the world. In other words, God knew when he created man, that man uh, would sin, and but he had already planned salvation. How shall we escape, the scripture says, how shall we escape the damnation of hell? How shall we escape the judgment of God if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape? You know, when I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, um, I could... Uh, doctrinally certain things uh, were not in line and that's fine but the whole message there was the sacrifice that one man Jesus Christ the righteous man of God had paid that price for each one of us and all that came through as I was watching that movie all that came through how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation he needs to be first in our lives all other things need to take their place. But one place in our lives is the place for God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He needs to be supreme in our hearts, in our lives. Not just the Savior. I remember many people preaching and said, Do you want to go to heaven? Just raise your hand. Well, I'm sure if you really knew what hell's all about, everybody wants to go to heaven. But there's a price. There's a price. Not just Savior, but Lord. Lord supreme in our hearts and in our lives. Who's the greatest in our lives? 
Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So when Jesus was about to endure the cross, there was something, even though he was troubled and disturbed, about the price he had to pay. But there's one thing that kept him going, and that's the joy he set before. And that joy was to bring many sons and daughters back to God the Father, back into the kingdom of God. So valuable, so precious are we to God that He paid the supreme price to ransom us out of darkness. Even so, by one man, for, for, uh, in Romans 5.17 it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned, in other words, through Adam, death began to reign because of his disobedience, death began to reign by one much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. Have you received Jesus? Because it's the grace of God that we receive Him. And have we received Jesus? By that power, by that authority, we receive abundance of grace and we reign in this life over all the circumstances, all the tribulation, all the challenges we go through, but thank God He will deliver us out of them all. And thank God while we're going through it, we are being matured and we are <clears throat> in His hand and we are changed from glory unto glory. Romans 5.21 That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. So we reign in this life by the grace of God. Sin has reigned in our lives before. But thank God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, washed in the blood of Jesus, we can now reign in this life. That the grace of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit, we can reign in this life, in eternity. Uh, 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. We belong to Him. We belong to the kingdom of God. We belong to the Father. We belong to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We are in the kingdom of God. We walk in the fullness. But Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, Since... The children are partakers of flesh and blood. He himself also, likewise, took part of the same. That through death, that he might destroy him. He might destroy him that had the power of death, and that is the devil. Through death, Jesus had to suffer the death on the cross. He had to go <coughs> into Hades because he had to overcome death on our behalf. That he can have, give us eternal life. He came to destroy. That means to render entirely useless. He made it to render entirely useless the power of death and the power of Satan. To render it entirely useless will not hold us captive, will not hold us captive in the grave, in hell, will not hold us captive because we are free. Whom the Son of God sets free is obviously free indeed. Now, it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, when Jesus, after the partaking of the Passover with his disciples, they went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in that garden, he took Peter and John, um, uh, Peter, James, and John, he took them apart. And he said, Pray, pray with me. And then he went apart aside. And he said to them, Pray. And of course, what happened uh, many times when you want to pray, fall asleep. That's exactly what happened to them. But, and he was in agony because he knew the cup that we, he was about to partake of was the cup of the judgment and the curse of God. The judgment on man. And Jesus willingly took that cup. Even though he went through all the trials and tribulation while he was in there. And it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat, was it were, 
great drops of blood falling to the ground. It was not a symbolic falling. It was actual, the uh, blood vessels had burst because of the agony that he was facing, the tribulation, the cross, the, the sin of the world coming upon him. He was looking at all of those things. This is what's going to happen. And then he had also prayed. And he said, Abba Father, all things are possible unto you. If you be willing, if there's some other way for man to be saved, <clears throat> if you're willing, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And there appeared unto him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And three times he prayed that. But his, the agony that he faced, the judgment, the trial, <clears throat> the crucifixion, the, the hurt, the pain, everything that he had to go through, that the, the pressure was so great. And then he said, even though not my will, but your will be done. If there was some other way, thank God, <clears throat> there is no other way into salvation. Uh, the scripture says he beca became sorrowful and very heavy. And he said, my soul, this is in Matthew 26 verse 37. He says, my soul, my natural man, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, beyond measure, exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He could, that, that, was, that agony was so great that he could have even died from that. Thank God he didn't. But that was, and he explained it to his disciples and he wanted them to pray with him, help him, strengthen him. And they fell asleep. That distress that he was facing, but thank God he gave his life as a ransom for many. He saw the pearl of great price. He saw the value of the purchase that he was going to make and bring many sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus knew these scriptures. He was a priest. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. For he brought, is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He didn't complain. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He, was made, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put on him, put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. In other words, that pressure that he went through just in the garden, he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. In Isaiah 52 verse 14 it says, And many were astonished at thee, because his visage, his image was so marred, more than any man and the form of more than the sons of men and he had to go through the scourging that the Roman soldiers had taken him through so when he was betrayed in the garden <coughs> by Judas with a kiss sometimes you're betrayed by some of those that are the closest we need to be very cautious led by the Spirit of God but he was betrayed he went to the judgment with um, Pontius Pilate and it says the, the scripture says and this is a, a description that Jesus knew from Psalm 129 verse 3 Jesus knew of the judgment the unfairness the false accusations and he said the plowers plowed on my back and they made long their furrows what a description of the lashing of and with that cat and nine tails from the Roman soldiers. And they beat him just to the point of death. 
So it was that the plowers, but you know that the scripture was talking about when the plowers, as they were ripping off his flesh, as they were ripping off the skin and punishing Jesus, a righteous man, the righteous man of God, as they were doing that, God was preparing something wonderful. We'll discuss it now. Carried his cross. In fact, he couldn't even carry his own cross all the way. Someone had, they sent, um, what's his name? <clears throat> they sent a man to help him to the cross. And then they nailed him to the cross. Absolutely exhausted, weak as a man. And there he hung on the cross for our sin. But one of the greatest things that he had to face was a separation from the Father for three hours on the cross. There was darkness. And that's where he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That, <clears throat> that the sin of the world was laid on Jesus. He never sinned once, but he became the ransom. In order to do that, he had to take on the sin of the world. Take on the punishment on our behalf. Be the intermediary on our behalf before God. And thank God He did that for us. And there was an interesting thing on the cross. Brenda was discussing it this morning. The words that Pontius Pilate he said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he wrote it in three languages and they complained. They said, no, no, He said He was King. Pontius Pilate said, that's it. What I've written, I've written and I'm not going to change it. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he wrote it in three languages. And Brenda brought, uh, brought to my uh, understanding that they were the three known languages of throughout the empire. So the whole world will know Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And therefore it was nailed to the cross. <clears throat> and when he cried, it is finished. In other words, not part of the sacrifice, not part of the redemption, but the full redemption price to purchase us out of darkness into His marvelous light, to purchase us from the power of Satan to the power of God. In that moment, when He said it is finished, He knew that He paid the full price for our sins. And behold the veil. This is in Matthew 27 verse 51. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two, from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So the moment he said, it is finished, God ripped open from the top, and the veil in the temple, <coughs> it is finished. Satan, you no longer have that authority over man any longer. You no longer have the power of death over man, because eternal life, he came to bring eternal life and therefore that ripping open his flesh as they plowed open his flesh the scripture talks about his flesh the sacrifice the <coughs> broken flesh is what ripped open now the presence of God is forever open for every one of us I am the door by me if any man enter by me not by some other way but by me Jesus Christ if any man shall enter in through faith, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John chapter 10 verse 9. Jesus opened the doorway. Now we have access to the Father. And in Hebrews it says, we have access through the blood of Jesus, the blood that was shed and sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. We now have access to the Father into the very presence of God boldly and find grace find mercy first and grace to help in time of need we need the divine grace of god the holy spirit the spirit of grace we need the holy spirit in every area of our lives thank god he's opened that doorway for us for eternal life hallelujah we have a place with the father and with the son and the holy spirit and of course they <clears throat> they said no no you, uh, they put him in the tomb and the Jews went and said, no, no, you must make sure that he's not coming out. That his disciples don't come and steal his body and said he's resurrected. 
thank God that resurrection, those four soldiers that kept him uh, imprisoned in that uh, tomb, <clears throat> when the angel rolled away that stone and he came out, they stood as dead. The power of God was so powerful and so present. Thank God he was not in the tomb. He was seen of over 500 disciples. 500 disciples, the ascension of Jesus Christ. There was a scene of over 500 disciples. But that's the power. He's not here. He's risen. And thank God for the resurrection. Otherwise, we wouldn't have faith. We would have a religion, but not a relationship. Because if he was still in the grave, and people saw him, his disciples saw him physically with a glorified body, and they also saw him ascend into heaven. And the angel said to them, what are you looking at? He says, as you've seen him go, so will you see him return. And he's coming back. And our time is very short, I believe, on this earth <clears throat> as it uh, is today. Paid the full price for every one of us. That sacrifice so great, a salvation. How shall we escape the damnation of hell? How shall we escape the judgment of God if we neglect such a great salvation? So thank God for His forgiveness. Thank God for what He's provided for us. So our failure came short. Come short of the glory of God. Our own efforts come short of the glory of God. We need to know that through Jesus Christ, as we repent, turn away from our sin, Lord help me. It's not that I'm doing, turn away and try and be good and try and, no, it's a decision in our hearts. Lord help me. I'm turning from sin. I don't want this darkness anymore. I don't want this sin in my life. I want to turn to Jesus. And I want to come through the doorway accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that <clears throat> I can have a divine purpose with you. And have eternal life. And that's through Christ Jesus we have the doorway and access into the Father's presence. God has provided the only way that each person must make the choice. Every one of us. We must choose whom we are going to serve. That's what um, Joshua said to the people, choose you this day. When you hear the word of God, choose this day. Yes, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Not tomorrow, not the next day. I'm going to serve you from now until eternity. By your grace, not by my own strength. Not because I'm somebody great, but because I depend upon you. I depend upon the blood of Jesus. I depend upon the Holy Spirit power within. And therefore, Lord, I want to serve you by your grace and power the rest of my life and spend eternity with you. So we need to choose. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There is only one that paid the full sacrifice. There was only one righteous man after Adam, after he had sinned. There's only one righteous man that could pay the full penalty price for us. And therefore, we are the pearl of great price that he saw the value of every one of us. And he said, come, come out of darkness into the marvelous light. Come and receive the forgiveness. Come and inherit eternal life. Inherit the blessings. It's part of what God has designed through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in that blood. And we used to sing a song, <coughs> and it, <coughs> it was, There's power, wonder-working power, <laughs> in the blood. Uh, we sang that every, every church service in that one church we used to go to, because we knew we depend upon the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness, and we can walk in that fullness of God's presence and God's blessing. And now we want to just pray for you. Father, we release your anointing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We know that the price that was paid, that supreme price of Jesus Christ giving up His life as a ransom to purchase us out of darkness, what value we, you saw in us. Many of us have not seen value in our own lives, but thank God, God saw value. And if He sees the value, then greater is He that is in me than he that's in the world. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your great sacrifice for each one of us. And Lord, as you said, as much as often as you eat of the bread and drink of that cup, <clears throat> you show the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you. We can do it 
and we do it in remembrance of you. We remember you this day, Father. What a great, great day in the history of the creation of the world. We thank you for that. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, thank you for your anointing. Thank you that even flows even right now, touches the hearts and lives, bringing transformation into the image and the glory of the Lord into the image of Jesus. And now we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.